Welcome to Forbes Talks. Joining me now is Sean Harper, a contributor here at Forbes. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. As you know, you cover diversity, equity, and inclusion. There was a big DEI push starting in 2020. But two years out, have you seen tangible growth in the workplace when it comes to DEI? The answer is yes and no. Following the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, many CEOs, executives, and other leaders in companies stepped up and made statements declaring that those murders were horrific, acknowledging the existence of systemic racism, and calling for more attention on diversity, equity, and inclusion broadly within their workplaces. That is praiseworthy, it's commendable, it was exciting at that time. But unfortunately, what we've seen over the past two and a half years since that moment is a fizzling of that corporate enthusiasm, uh, surely for systemic racism, but really for you know other aspects of, of DE&I. Um, so on the one hand, yes, it got so much more attention in 2020, but you know, really here now at the end of 2022, um, not so much. So two years later, have these promises been made and how can people keep them accountable? Well, one way we can hold businesses accountable is uh, calling for them to make good on the financial promises they made in the name of George Floyd. One of my Forbes pieces, um, you know, is asking where is the $200 billion, billion with a B, that companies pledged in summer 2020? So many of those dollars remain uncommitted and therefore unspent, right? And many of the leaders who made those commitments, um, you know, time bound them, right? It was, you know, a billion dollars over, you know, the next three years, four years, or five years. Well, now we're two and a half years in, and so many of those companies and the people who lead them have not spent the money. So that is, I think, the most pressing thing that, you know, uh, that we need in terms of accountability. But even for organizations that did not make financial investments, many of them did make verbal promises, certainly to their Black employees, to their employees of color, and really to all of their other employees, their white employees too, that they were going to take DE&I much more seriously. So I, I do think that accountability means developing a strategy, not just having a one-time workshop on implicit bias or you know a one-time a one-time town hall um, on systemic racism, but you know really getting serious about embedding DEI into every aspect of the business. Let's talk about how can business leaders really, instead of these blanket statements, maybe a one-time workshop, embed this in their greater strategy? Sure. We have to think about it in the ways that we think about other um, business functions and practices. For example, many companies rely so heavily on technology not just for one function of the business, but really for just about everything that the business does, right? You have to think about the, the, the goodness and the reliability of those technological resources. Well, we have to think about DE&I in the same way. Imagine, for example, if you run a business and the Wi-Fi goes out or there's no internet access, right? That business is brought to its knees for you know, the 10 minutes, 30 minutes, hour, half hour, whatever it is that that there's no internet. We have to think about DE&I in, in that same way, right? Like, you know, it's not just a thing that ought to, you know, sit over here in the chief diversity officer's shop, but we have to think about it in the ways that we think about technology, for example, or the ways that we think about financial stability. And obviously the past two and a half, and now almost three years, remote work has really come into a factor since the pandemic. And a lot of offices are either remote or a hybrid. So how does DNI, DE and I efforts factor into this? Yeah, my very first piece on Forbes.com was about the 
DEI implications of remote work. And it was in response to this really great announcement that Meta made about um, the increase of employees of color over, you know, uh, some period of time during the pandemic. And, you know, you know, Facebook Meta in the report was saying that part of that increase was attributable to the company's willingness to um, let more people work from home. So therefore, you know, they attracted more diversity. In the article, I praised the flexibility of that company. But then I also talked about not just for Facebook Meta, but also for other companies, how we have to be mindful of ensuring that those diverse employees who are working remotely are being afforded opportunities to be seen and to lead um, in ways that will ultimately facilitate their acceleration and their you know, advancement to more senior level lead, uh, leadership roles within the organizations. So that is the thing that ought to you know, continue to be top of mind for managers and people leaders and executives, right? You know, ensuring that there are equitable opportunities for those uh, colleagues who are working remotely to have opportunities for advancement. What you're describing sounds kind of like a mixed bag when it comes to remote work. So does remote work make it easier or harder for DEI measures to be adhered to? Yeah, I think it makes it harder in the absence of strategy. This is not an unsolvable problem. It just requires, you know, executives and other leaders to think preemptively um, about what equity looks like and what it will require for uh, colleagues who are working remote, as well as those who are working on site. I mean, let's not forget about the in-person on-site employees, but um, I, I do think that this is a, a, a solvable challenge, but not in the absence of strategy. You know, way too many companies, not just on uh, the question of remote work, but really on so many other aspects of DEI. So many companies believe that haphazard one-time programming kinds of things or food festivals, that those kinds of things are going to move the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They don't, right? We have to treat it like we treat the finance strategy. You know, we don't just give the keys to the CFO and say, okay, take off in the car and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Like, no, we expect that person to have KPIs. We expect that person to do some, some modeling and to communicate and collaborate with others throughout the organization to ensure the fiscal health um, of, the, of the business. We have to treat DEI in that same way, including on the metric of remote work equity. I hear you. So let's say you're the CEO of a company right now. How would you implement this strategy and make it happen so that there is a really tangible DEI strategy in place? Yeah, well, first off, it has to be in partnership with the people. And by the people, I mean employees, those who work on site, as well as those who are working from home or working remotely. Um, that's going to be really important. Um, too many well-intended leaders will go and make policy or develop strategy without meaningful input from the people who are actually going to be affected by those policies and strategies. So step one would be to bring uh, folks to the table, colleagues, teammates to the table, um, including those who work remotely. Um, also, I think, you know, part of what the strategy requires is thinking about what are the existing pathways to advancement and to pay equity and so on within the company. And then to rethink those pathways through the prism of remote work, right? Like here's what it has taken, you know, historically to advance in our company. Now let's rethink what that means for people who we don't see in the office, you know, three days a week or five days a week or ever, right? Um, you know, those are two things that immediately come top, top of mind. 
Looking forward, are you optimistic about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace in 2023 as we sit right on the cusp of the new year? I am absolutely optimistic. You know, it is that optimism that, you know, fuels me every day in the things that I write, certainly the courses that I teach here at USC, and definitely in the work that I do with the dozens and at times hundreds of, of companies and organizations. Um, but that optimism has to be met with strategy, right? Um, I think one of the things that I attempt to do is help leaders develop robust, sustainable DEI strategies, not just programming. So if 2023 is going to look different than 2022 and you know prior years, it's going to be because business leaders finally took seriously the responsibility of developing sustainable strategy around DEI. We talked about uh, business leaders, but how can employees really hold these business leaders accountable for this? Sure. I think employees have so much more power than they recognize. Um, you know, business leaders don't really like scandals or public facing stories that, you know, call attention to failures within within the business. I think that employee resource groups and, you know, other groups of employees ought to come together and think about how they can leverage their collective uh, voices and flex their collective muscle um, to help leaders understand how vulnerable the business is to public scrutiny on its failure to enact the DEI values that it espouses. So in other words, what I'm suggesting, um, you know, I'm not necessarily calling for, you know, diverse employees to, you know, gather in protest. What I am suggesting, though, is that when they speak in a unified voice, one that is serious, um, you know, it is more likely to um, compel leaders to act much more swiftly and um, hopefully much more strategically and sustainably. Sean Harper, thank you so much. And I hope that you'll join us in the new year and we can talk about this as it unfolds. Of course, it would be my pleasure. Thanks for having me.